so grateful to be uh, back in 1 Corinthians again to finish out chapter 4 um, of 1 Corinthians. And not to be like overly repetitive in any sense, but we want to make sure we understand the context. Otherwise, we won't understand what we're talking about with 4. Um, and uh, Paul has been repeating himself in some areas on purpose. He's emphasizing this point. He does the same thing in Romans. He builds up his argument, and then he kind of overlaps his arguments together, and he's been doing that in 1 Corinthians. But, but Corinth is a wealthy city, lots of philosophies, lots of religions, right? Lots of false gods, and in the midst of all that, um, God establishes this, this church at Corinth. And, and God uses Paul and, and a team of people to establish this church in Corinth. And he'd worked there for like 18 months helping grow that church, discipling people, mentoring leaders, and doing all of this groundwork. But a lot's changed since he has left. Not only are they dividing over non-important things and, and, and playing this division game of like, well, they do it this way, and I like this leader over here. And, and this, when they come together, it's a bad thing. And actually, they hurt each other when they come together as a church. Um, not only that, but as we'll see heading into the next part of 1 Corinthians, there's also some really deep sexual sin issues going on as well um, and having to address these sins that they're not addressing. And, but it seems like... Uh, the church at Corinth has allowed men's philosophies, men's ideas to, to influence the church. In other words, um, it's not hip and cool anymore just to be like, thus says the Lord, this is how it is. No, let's also incorporate some of men's ideas and men's philosophies and mix that into what we believe. And they're, and they're, having, they're being friends with all these different religions and philosophies, and they've allowed that to kind of seep in and affect how they think and affect how they teach. And that's what he's been getting at when he's been talking about, like, I don't talk and preach with men's wisdom, but I, I preach what the Holy Spirit is, is doing in our lives, and I teach the Word of God. And, and so he's trying to push back against all these philosophies and ideas that are influencing uh, the church at Corinth. They've been distracted by that. So within that context of understanding what's going on, we're actually going to back up and start in verse 8. We, we did verse 8 last week, but verse 8 is actually the beginning of a new paragraph. So I'm the guy who preached this sermon and started a new paragraph. So no one would do that. All right, verse 8 says this, Now ye are full, now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. And he says this in kind of a sarcastic way. He said, you're acting like you're reigning as kings. You act like you have your lives completely together, like there isn't sin, like there isn't division, like you don't need any more teaching, you don't, I don't have nothing else to learn. They act like they've already been sanctified, they're already glorified. They're, it's like they're in the new heaven, new earth, reigning with Jesus, like everything's just hunky-dory. And, and Paul's like, I wish that was true. I wish it was true that we're in the new heaven and new earth. I wish it was true that we're reigning with Christ together. But that's not true. Because if it was, we'd be reigning with you. And he transitions that to start telling them what they're going through. So while you're in Corinth thinking that you're reigning as kings and everything's, everything's cool and everything's fine, let me tell you what's going on outside of Corinth and the church at Corinth. Let me tell you what's going on in the world. Let me tell you what's going on with me and the other apostles. Because we're not reigning as, as kings. We're not in the new heaven and new earth. And he begins to describe what's going on in verse 9. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. Now for clarity here, understand he's not complaining. He's not saying this to complain like, man, what we're going through stinks. He's saying he thinks that this was God's will for them to go through what they're going through. He's not complaining. He's informing them of what's going on. And he uses this word spectacle unto the world. Now, this word spectacle, one commentator wrote this. Paul's mention of a spectacle, which is the Greek word theatron, which is like theatrical display, 
It doesn't mean like a movie or a play going on. Some have interpreted it that way of like, it's like they're, they're on a platform and everyone's listening to them. No, it's, it's not saying that. It's referring to the arena where victims, usually criminals, were led in procession before the last public show of the day and then executed before the eager spectators. So this is the imagery he wants the church at Corinth to see. While they're reigning as kings and, and they're, they're you know, hanging out with all different kinds of philosophers and having that affect their thinking and dividing over things that aren't important. It says, meanwhile, we feel like we're in last place. You feel like you're in first place winning this. We feel like we're the last ones being drugged out as gladiators as out to the, in front of all these spectators and mocked and killed in front of everybody. That's what we feel like. So while you're up there in the stands, hanging out with the world and everybody else, we're the ones being mocked and killed as criminals in front of everyone, in front of men and angels. This is the imagery that he's setting in place for them. So while you're out there, while you're enjoying your little Corinthian bubble, here's what's going on in the world. Here's what's going on for the apostles. This is what God has for us. While you're over there, not taking a stand for Christ, but instead being really weak in your theology and weak in your divisions and all these things. This is what's going. So this is the picture he begins to paint of what they're going through. But then he goes on to describe what they're going through. He doesn't just create this imagery of like gladiator games and they're out there to be killed in front of everybody. He, he goes on to give details. He says in verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. He's saying, wow, well, we're out there propagating the gospel, putting our lives on the line for the cause of Christ. We're looked at as fools. We're looked at as weak. And we're despised. Meanwhile, you guys in Corinth are like, oh, those, those nice wise Christians in Corinth. They're nice and strong. They're, they're honorable. So while their friends in Corinth are just like, oh, wow, amazed. With the, they're over there being looked at as fools and despised and rejected. Verse 11. Even unto this present hour. He's not just talking about stuff that has happened or stuff that might happen. He's describing to them what he and other apostles are going through at that time. Now he's going to give them some examples. We both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. So while you're blessed with all your riches and wealth and popularity in Corinth, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we're naked, we're beaten, we don't have a place to go home. Once again, he's not complaining, he's informing them. While you're living it up in Corinth, here's what's going on in the world. Here's what's going on around you. He says in verse 12, and labor working with our own hands. And the English here doesn't really quite express this fully like, like it would in the Greek, but it's, it's the idea of, of toiling. It's the idea of working to exhaustion. Not like I had a long day at work. I mean, it's day in, day out, all day, no break. It's work nobody wants to do. In fact, the terminology used in the Greek here would have been used for like the work that their slaves would do. It would look, basically they'd say it's, it's beneath us type of work. So they're doing the work that no one else wants to do and they're exhausted. So not only are they thirsty and hungry and naked, have no home, they're exhausted and they're doing what no one else wants to do. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Well, this has to hit home hard because while they're all gathered together, and he says when they come together, it's for the worse. 
it's like, well, we're not with this small group over here because our group's better over here, and we, we like this pastor better than this one and this teacher. And then let's also talk about, let's add human philosophy into this too, and let's get divide over that too. And I think this, this is how the world works, and this is this thing over here. And he's like, listen, we're out everywhere else being beaten, despised, and rejected for proclaiming the gospel. And when they reject us and beat us and imprison us and mock us, we bless them. We love them. We share the love of Christ with them even though they are our enemy. Meanwhile, you're in Corinth cursing your brothers and sisters over things that aren't important. And we're blessing our enemies. He's implying if anyone had a right to be angry with someone, it would be them. But no, they're blessing their enemies. Meanwhile, Corinth is cursing their brothers and sisters. Verse 13 says, Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. Filth of the world and offscoring. In other words, the, the dregs of society. Or in other words, considered to be immoral and with no value. We're talking about the apostles here. He's saying this is how the world looks at us. We're immoral and have no value. This seems to be like extreme, but I want you to understand something. They're declaring that there's one God. They're declaring that Jesus is deity and he's the only way to the Father. They're declaring that Jesus resurrected from the dead. They're declaring that everyone else, if they have any other perspective, they're wrong. This is the one way. This, this is no different than today. This would be considered immoral to say today. To say that Jesus is the only way. That the God of the Bible is the only God. This is considered insulting. This is considered arrogant. This would be immoral in our society to make that declarative statement. Well, it's okay in your house of worship. It's okay to talk about with, if that works for you, we're not talking about what works for us. We're talking about what is the truth. And the truth is that Jesus, the perfect son of God, is the only way to the Father. So whether that's popular or not to say, it's the reality in which we live. It is the truth. And we should declare it boldly, no matter what society thinks. But for the Corinthians, it's not cool anymore to take such a dogmatic stance. Well, it works for us, and, but your philosophy has some good ideas in it too. And like, Well, no. He's like, hey, we're making this stand, and it's considered immoral. We're considered to have no value. No value. So these are the things that Paul and the apostles and pastors and missionaries are going through around the world at this time. But this isn't happening at Corinth. And at this point, he's been, he's been really hammering them in this first part of the letter, talking about the way they've been thinking and the way that they've been living. And he's going to address sin next in the letter. But as the leaders of the church are reading this letter from Paul to the congregation and, and to the different houses that are meeting, there has to be a level of shame or embarrassment. We're kind of playing church, they're probably thinking. Hopefully, if they're reading the letter correctly and being convicted by the Holy Spirit, man, we've been playing church. We've been like dividing over silly stuff and we've been arguing over men's philosophies and we've been allowing that to affect us. Meanwhile, our leaders are out there being killed for taking a stand for Jesus. What are we doing? There has to be a level of embarrassment and shame in this moment. But I want you to keep in mind that what he's describing is not just isolated to the context in which he's writing. This is true today. Sometimes we get so focused into our circle of our household or our city or our state or our country and we don't see what's going on outside our circle. 
We don't understand what other people are going through. Whether that's the person down the street or whether that's the person across the sea. I don't know if any of you follow uh, Johnny Esposito on Facebook. He's one of our missionaries. Um, and on Instagram as well. You can basically same content on both, but whatever your favorite platform is on this. He keeps you up to date on what's going on in the world. And he does a really great job of smacking people in the face. Um, not literally. I mean with his words of like, hey! Because he knows what's going on over in third world countries. He understands the persecution. When he was here, he mentioned while he was teaching for our combined groups, he goes, please don't talk to me about persecution. I have a pastor friend that's been in jail for 13 months and hasn't been able to see his family for preaching the gospel. So please don't talk to me about persecution. He said that on this platform while he was here. He wrote this post this week from a missionary friend in Iraq. One of our contacts shared this message from an Afghan believer about a terrible dilemma he is facing. Tell me, what is the godly thing to do? Can you just imagine as a leader in your church or, or just someone as trying to be a help and a blessing to someone in the church and you get this text message from somebody. Tell me what the godly thing is to do. My village is newly controlled by the Taliban and they're demanding I give them my teenage daughter as a bride. Should I take up arms? Should I give her to them? Should I quickly marry her off to my neighbor or relative so she doesn't have to marry these soldiers? They wrote, somehow our first world problems seem to fade into nothingness when compared to situations like these that are now becoming commonplace for believers in Afghanistan. Wow. This isn't just stuff we read about in the Bible. This is stuff that's happening in our world today. We've talked a lot about the missions team in, in Cambodia and how when someone come, a lot of younger people, when they come to Christ, they have to choose between their family or the church. Like there isn't and, it's, and not this like kind of like they get rejected completely. They lose like their birthright. And it's almost impossible for them. It makes it difficult for them to get a job. It makes it hard for them to be able to travel, to, to function in society. Because basically they take away their, their name out of the family book, which would be like they don't have a birth certificate and they can't get one. I just want to read a few headlines just so you understand what's going in outside of our circle. These are just news headlines from four days ago. Egypt, pray for this mother and her daughter who had to flee because of their faith. Here's another headline. Because of Iran's oppressive Islamic regime, many Iranian Christians must gather in secret and receive teaching through Christian broadcast media. In uh, Cameroon, pray for tribal Christians in the north whose villages are routinely attacked. In Oman, pray for Joseph who lost all of his worldly possessions because of his faith in Jesus Christ. This headline from Ethiopia says this, Enjor's husband converted to Christianity and became a leader in their church. On the day of the attack on their homes, Enjor was home with the children she saw a mob coming and ran for safety. When she returned the next day, all that was left was ashes. They had nothing left. The family lived with several others in the church under a tarp. Then Andrew's husband went to be with the Lord. Through this hardship, Andrew had to make specific choices to trust God and follow him through her pain and loss. Another headline says this from July, the end of July of this year. Tens of thousands of our Christian brothers and sisters have been driven from their homes by Islamic extremists in Africa and in the Middle East. In Cuba, pray for pastors pressured to provide the government with information about church leaders. And I'll read this last one. Earlier this month, Islamists abducted more than 100 students from Bethel Baptist High School in Nigeria's northern Kaduna state. The attackers 
arrived on motorbikes, shooting wildly into the air as they broke through the school's perimeter fence. While some students escaped, at least 125 are still missing after this latest in a string of mass kidnappings during this past year. There are so many attacks and kidnappings happening in Nigeria right now. This is the 10th mass school kidnapping since December. Ongoing attacks by Fulani Islamic militants throughout Nigeria have resulted in the deaths and abductions of thousands of Christians since the beginning of the year. Nowhere in Nigeria is safe anymore. People are being killed by militant Fulani Muslim men for no reason. They're not even safe in their own homes. Every one of these headlines have to do with Christians teaching or preaching the gospel and being persecuted for it. The headlines keep going on and on and on and on. This isn't just back then. This is today. And it's important for us as we live where we live and we have the protections that we have. We need to look outside of our circle and see what's going on in the world. So while we might be dividing and arguing over silly stuff and we might be listening to men's philosophies and go, hmm, I wonder if there's any... Well, there, instead of taking a stand for Christ and preaching the gospel, it's literally costing people their lives, their homes, their everything for sharing Jesus for proclaiming his word. Now I'm glad what Paul says next. He says in verse 14, I write not these things to shame you. This is really important. Keep in mind, they're feeling shame at this point. And, it, and, it, and if we're not looking outside of our circle and we're getting arrogant and, and we're just kind of like doing our own thing and not paying attention, like there can be some shame in that. Of like, man, I didn't know that was going on in the world. I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't know I was costing people this much. I didn't, I didn't know all this. But that's not why Paul's telling us this. He's not saying this for us to feel ashamed about it, even though it might be natural to feel shame for it. But he doesn't want them to feel shame. He says this. My ultimate goal is not to, have to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. As my beloved sons, I warn you. This word beloved here is talking about agape love. It's talking about the strongest kind of love he can have for them. I love you like you're my kids. I'm not saying this because I want you to tuck your tail and hide in the corner and be like, I didn't know. Like, no, like, yeah, I've been persecuted for you. The apostles are being persecuted for you. While you're kind of being wish-washy on the gospel and, and arguing and dividing and being ridiculous, this is what it's costing us. But I'm not saying this just to make you sit back and feel bad. I love you, and I'm saying this to warn you. And this doesn't just mean warn. In the Greek here, this word is about admonishing. It's, it's about them changing I'm saying this because I want you to repent of the way that you're going and go this way. So stop playing with men's philosophies and ideologies. Stop intermixing their religions into yours and, and, and stop living in this sexual sin and, and, and stop dividing over these things you shouldn't be dividing over. There's a cost at this. And there's, another, there's a warning mixed in with that too. Like if you take a stand for Christ, the comfort you have, this, this feeling of being in first place in current, that's gone. You start saying God is one God, you start saying Jesus is the only way, you're going to start losing friends. But you're missing out on the joy of the Lord. You're missing out on the calling he has on your life to be wish-washy and kind of like, oh, like, take a stand. I'm warning you. I don't want you to stay ashamed and be like, man, I didn't know what you were going through for us. No, you need to take a stand. I want you to repent and change. Not just feel shame. I want you to change. I want you to change. His love for them is authentic. He's not just some preacher that's beating them over the head. Like, how dare you? He said, no, I love you. You're like my kids. 
And any of us who are parents in here know that disciplining our kids isn't any fun. A good parent doesn't want to discipline their kids, but a good parent does. Paul's not taking joy in saying this to them. He's like, wake up. We're getting killed out here. You know I'm teaching the truth of God's word. You know I've lived it out in my life. You know that I understand I'm accountable to God. And I'm out there on the front lines being persecuted for my faith. What are you willing to do? So stop telling me you like this guy better than me or I like that guy this and we had this way of doing it and we like this little philosophy over here. Like, What are you going to do? I'm tired of hearing all this talk about men's ideas and philosophies and divisions. What are you going to do? You're going to stand for the gospel or not? Repent and change. And he says this in verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ. This, this phrase here of 10,000 instructors in Christ, it doesn't necessarily mean literally 10,000. He just means you have a whole lot or you have an innumerable amount of teachers. They didn't have 10,000. They didn't have 10,000 teachers in their life, 10,000 instructors in their life. He's just saying this ridiculous high number, this ridiculous amount. That you might have 10,000 teachers. You might have a plethora, an, an amazing amount of teachers that we can't even count. Yet you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Remember what I said at the beginning? He was there. He's the one who was mentoring these initial elders in the church and establishing these leaders in the church. He's the one who's winning people to Christ and discipling people and seeing the 18 months pouring into people, mentoring people. So he's saying, I was there when this church was birthed. I, I was there with you when you left some of those worldly philosophies. I was with you when you left those other religions and your family rejected you. And I walked with you through that. I was there. I'm not just some guy. I'm not just some guru. I'm not just some guy out there. You know me. I'm like your dad. We've cried together. We've written to each other. We've communicated with each other. We've prayed over each other. So don't just blow me off. Because you know I care. You know how passionate I am about you. There's so much that can be said in regards to this verse. I'll say this. For us, it's not um, out of, it's not a crazy thing to say 10,000 instructors. We have so much information at our fingertips. We have more than 10,000 instructors that are available at our fingertips because of the internet. There's a whole bunch of teachers you can find on YouTube and on podcasts and all of that. You can order their books on Amazon. You, people put on conferences that you can go to or watch online. Like, just the list goes on. You can read, you have all these books, whether old philosophers or old theologians to the most recent. Thousands upon ten thousands of leaders. Some good, most bad. <laughs> But whether or not the content's good or bad, let's just focus in on the good content for a second. Let's say all I'm consuming is good content. There's one thing they cannot do. They can't know you the way that the people around you can. They can't love you the way that someone in this room can. They can't know what you're currently going through. Yeah, sure, you could send someone an email. Hey, I'm going, this. that's still not the same thing as someone that knows you and has walked through you and has prayed with you. The person that you know, if you call them, they're either going to answer or they're going to call you back. And all of us as believers in this room need to have someone in our life that is that mentor, that is that person, that believer that can walk through us, with us through those difficult times, that walks through us in our Christian life, that's helping us walk and grow in Christ. 
and all of us should be finding someone to mentor. Someone that you can be that person for, that you can love and pour into. Not just some person out there that has an idea, someone who actually cares and knows you and knows your personality and understands your past and understands what you're going through today that's there for you. That's what Paul was to many of the leaders there at Corinth. And he say, hey, I'm not nobody. Not only do you know I've taught God's word correctly, not only do you know I've lived it out, not only do you know I've been persecuted, not only do you know that I love you, you know I've been there for you. And we need to be there for each other. This is important with our, in our community as a church that we're pouring into each other and pouring each other to Jesus. We need to have that person in our life. So if, there's, if you don't have someone you can call, let me, let me just tell you something. I, I have people I can call. I'm one of the pastors here. We're about to go plants over there. I have people that I call. I have people that I consider mentors in my life. I have people that I call when I'm going through stuff. I have people that I call when I'm working through stuff. Everybody needs that. We're not meant to do this in isolation. We're not meant to walk the Christian life in isolation. We're meant to have it in community where we can grow in each other and help each other. So have someone like that in your life and be someone like that in someone's life. Be that mentor in someone's life that they need. He loves them like a dad. I know you can find all this great content out there, but that's no uh, and there's some good stuff out there. I listen to content online. I read books, all of that. But they can't be that person in my life. They can't be that specific mentor in my life. They can't be that person that can call me out when they know I'm lying to them. <laughs> when you say you're okay and they know you're not. He says in verse 16, he breaks down this a little bit further. He says, wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. In the next verse, he comes clear. He's not just saying in general, follow me. He, he makes it really clear in 1 Corinthians 11. 1, he says, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ, right? He's not saying, um, whatever I eat, you should eat. When we go to the restaurant, order the same food as me. It's not what he's saying. He's saying, whatever, uh, whatever cloak I wear, wear the same cloak as me. However, I do my hair, do the hair, like, do, do just like me, like how I do it. Just copycat me. Like, he doesn't mean that in a general sense. Some people try to put that on people, like, you need to be just like me. No. They get back to the whole division thing. Well, we like this guy over here, so we're going to follow his. Like, no. He's talking about in the way, Paul knows he's a sinner. He's talked about this in scripture. I'm like, man, what I want to do, what I don't do, and what I do, it. he's an open sinner, right? They know he sins. He's saying, but as I've been a good example of how Christ should walk, follow me in those things. Where I've been a good example of what Jesus would do, follow me in those things. And so in regards to being that father figure or that, that mentor, or they're like my dad, they're like my mom. I have this person that, that's there in my life, right? It's not pulling people to your personal philosophies. It's not... It's not, it's not pulling people into your personal ideologies or your personal politics or whatever. It is pointing them to Christ. It's not about me and my ideas, my life. It's Jesus. And so he's not just openly saying, do what I do. He's saying, but give up all of these other men's philosophies, ideologies, all this, and let's get back to the basics. Let's follow God in his word. We're going to go this way. As I follow Christ, you follow me. So when you're being that mentor... Make sure you're being an example of what Jesus would do, not what you would do. Well, this is what I would do in this. No, what would Jesus do? Let's look at God's word. Let's follow that example. And when you're looking for someone to be a mentor in your life, make sure there's someone that understands that this is their source of truth. Make sure there's not just a cool person to follow. Make sure that they are a good example. Find someone that is strong in God's word. In verse 17, he says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. The ways of Christ, the way that people should walk, the way that people should live their lives. He's saying, I teach this the same everywhere. I'm not teaching this differently to Corinthians. I'm, I'm teaching this the same. Wherever I go, I teach it the same. 
But because of what's going on in Paul's life, he can't go right now. So he sends Timothy. And what I love about this with Timothy is that Paul trusts Timothy to go do it. Paul's not like, nope, this is a really bad situation. I have to do it myself. He said, no, God doesn't want me to go right now. But what I would teach you, I trust Timothy to do. So in talking about disciple making and talking about being a mentor and pouring into people, it's not just one layer. It's not like, good, I help some people. No, you're going to pour into people the ways of Christ, pour into them what God's word says, so they can go on to teach that to someone else. It's not just so I can receive it and go, cool, this really helped me to, to grow my faith. This really helped me to be strong. Okay, now take that and invest it into someone else. Invest it into the next generation. Invest it into your neighbors. Invest it into the far reaches of the world. Because Paul could not mentor everybody. Paul could not teach everyone. But he had this, uh, Pastor Kurt Skelly, when he was here this week, we got to meet with him, and, and he talked a little bit about mentorship um, when uh, we got to meet with him outside of our group. We, we talked some more about leadership with him, and he talked about how you can't mentor everybody. Paul didn't couldn't mentor it. Jesus had, a, had 12 disciples, right? He had, he, Jesus poured into lots of people, but he also had this close knit group of people that he could really mentor, and, and they could be true apprentices to him. And so Paul has that, and then he trusts them to go do it. And that's hard for us sometimes. You know, no matter what, maybe what the job that you work, whatever, we understand that sometimes it's really hard to let someone do what you're responsible for. <laughs> but that is how discipleship needs to work. This is how the gospel will spread. Is you trusting the people that you're mentoring and pouring into to go and do the same. To go and do the same. So you're investing in people. So if you're strong in the faith, you're a strong believer. Make sure that there's someone you're pouring into. Not just growing in your own faith, but help grow someone else's. This is, once again, how we're supposed to work within community together. Now, some people there are pretty arrogant and think Paul's just all smoke. And he's like, hey, you're not actually coming. You, you write some pretty strong letters. You say some pretty strong things, but I'm not scared. You ain't coming. <laughs> Verse 18, now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. They're arrogantly thinking, ah, Paul, not worried about that guy. I like, I don't even like him anyway. I like Apollos anyway. I don't really like Paul. They're still, they're still, he's still like, I know some of you guys. And I know you think I'm not coming. And he does get delayed from coming. But in verse 19, he says, but I will come to you. I will come to you shortly if the Lord will. And he says this, I'll come to you and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. He's going back to this idea he talked about in chapter 2 and verse 4 where he said, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So when I get there, I don't want to hear about your men's philosophies. If I'm going to get there and go, well, Paul, we heard what you said, but philosopher so-and-so said that people are generic, pretty much good. People, people are good. I mean, I know like you say people are sinners, but like people are kind of good. And then there's like people are different layers of good. And then some people, Paul doesn't want to talk about that. <laughs> Paul doesn't want to hear about some men's idea about how the world works. He's like, when I came the first time, I wasn't polished. I didn't come with smooth words. I didn't come like I had read all these philosophers' ideas. I just came in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming the gospel that you might have faith, that you might grow in the Lord, that you might know Jesus. I'm not going to come there to talk to you about all these different philosophies you learned at Corinth. And he doesn't want to hear about your new philosophies and new ideas and like, well, we have this new theory about why things are that way and, and we think it's that yada yada. He's like, no, I'm here. To declare the word of God to you. I'm here and I want my spirit to witness with your spirit that, that we're in the body of Christ together. We're not here to get along about men's philosophies and their ideas and their theories and their ideas. We don't need any of that. And, and for us today, we need to be very careful. Social media, the news, all, the news, all of that is just them saying their philosophy. Their philosophy. I don't know if you noticed this. The news just doesn't tell you what happens. I don't know if they ever did or not. I'm too young to know that. <laughs> 
Every single headline has an opinion in it. Every single Facebook post has a philosophy in it. People are constantly telling you how you should think. Don't fall for the trap. The Bible tells us how to think. This is not new. This has been going on for a long time. This will continue to happen. We know people do bad things because people are bad. That's what the Bible says. I don't have to come up with some philosophy. Oh, why'd that person kill all those people? Because they were bad. <laughs> we know that every single human life is intrinsically valuable. Why? Because the Bible says they are. I don't need a new theory to figure that out. God told me that. So we don't need new theories, new philosophies, and try to, let's mix it into the Bible. In fact, I think that'll help us understand Scripture. Someone wrote this like 10 years ago. Let's stick it in here. It's like, what are you doing? That's what they were doing in Corinth. What does God say? So Paul's like, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm not interested in all the divisions that are going on. Chloe told me all about that. I'm not interested in your divisions. I'm not interested in all your philosophies. I'm not interested in all that. All I know is that you're playing games. You're living in sin. You're, you're interested in all this, what this world has to say. Let's talk about God's word. Let's talk about what the Holy Spirit's doing in your midst. Let's see about the gospel going forward. I'm not there to talk about politics and philosophy. I'm there to talk about God. I'm here to talk about his word. And may we as a church never come to a place where we think that philosophies are more important, men's ideas and these things. Like, Let's stick with what God has to say because my opinion doesn't matter. says in verse 21, what will ye? I mentioned in the first service, I don't know who in the world were, were in charge of the, because the, Bibles didn't always have chapters and verses. I don't know if you know that. And before they put them in nice books with covers like this, they were like on scrolls and all this. There, was, there wasn't chapters and verses. Those came later. These are, this is a whole letter. You could read 1 Corinthians in one setting and see how it all connects and all that, right? They added those so we could find stuff easier. I don't know who put this here, but I feel like they're like, Man, chapter four, this would be a great way to put a chapter mark right here because he ended on a question. He just kind of leaves him hanging right there. He's like, he just like, it's up to you guys if I'm going to come mad or happy when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> what will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? And if you read the very next verse, he's thinking about coming with a rod. <laughs> if you want to know what's going on, it's bad. It's bad. It's really bad. But he's saying this, I love you like a dad. I love you like my own kids. But if I have to come with a rod, I'll come with a rod. If I have to come in discipline, I'll come with discipline. I'd rather come and just enjoy our time together. <laughs> I'd rather just come on, enjoy and love each other and pray with each other. But if I have to come and invoke discipline, then I will. But I'd much rather you heed my warning now and change. So I don't know if any of this sermon or chapter applies to you guys today. But let me say this. Before we ever have to see God's discipline in our lives. Before we have to face any type of difficult situation. Confess your sin to God. Don't let those things fester and grow there's division welding up in your soul and you're mad that I got to preach two sermons in a row and <laughs> don't let division stay there. If, you, if you've allowed men's ideas and men's philosophies to infiltrate how you should think, confess that to God. God, I want to I know what you want me to think. I want you to tell me what to believe. Not the world out there. Let's change. If any of those things are true of any of us. 
And as a church, let's not be arrogant to think that we would never be that arrogant. <laughs> and maybe for you this morning, I mean, you know you're a sinner. You're like, yep, I'm bad. <laughs> We're all sinners. And we deserve God's condemnation. We deserve his wrath. We deserve his anger. Because he's holy. And we're not. But that's why Jesus came. He came to pay the debt we could not pay. Because we sinned against an infinite God. And Jesus, God the Son, died in our place on the cross. And he proved or showed that it was truly him by resurrecting from the dead. See, he doesn't just offer us forgiveness. He offers us new life, a new birth. Not just one day, but now. He offers forgiveness and purpose. See, many of us have been searching for happiness in all kinds of things and thinking that Jesus, he's that guy about rules and doesn't want me to have any fun, right? When the reality is ultimate happiness and joy and peace and fulfillment is found in him because Jesus is life. Jesus is joy. Jesus is happiness. He says, if you give up everything you thought would make you happy, you give up your sin, you repent of that, place your faith in me, you realize I was who you're looking for the whole time. Don't need all this. I just need Jesus. I just need Jesus.